everybody. This is our uh, second EPIC seminar, uh, EPIC meaning Alt Physiology and Ion Research. Before I start, I'd just like to give a big thanks to Society for General uh, Physiologists for supporting this, and especially Greg and Jean, who, without whom this would be a uh, much, much worse organized. Um, so as you know, this is a platform for postdocs and, and junior faculty, and it's held uh, first Tuesday of every month. This is our second seminar, and we are really covering a wide range of topics, even some non-ion channel <laughs> uh, topics. So um, to promote um, networking and new connections, uh, one of the features of these seminars is uh, to support the speaker of the current month to host one-to-one -one meetings, uh, Zoom meetings um, between the people from their institution and the next uh, month's speaker. So we have to say that the first time around, it worked really well. And Willow has lined up some great uh, meetings for Tim uh, after, after Tim's talk today. So we'll really try and, and uh, be on time so that Tim um, uh, has time for all these Zoom meetings today. Uh, please do uh, nominate speakers. We have a, a long list already, but we accept nominations, including self-nominations. So if you think there is a postdoc or general faculty member who would fit the, the seminar idea um, well, then please, uh, by all means, do uh, do tell us about them. And there is a form on the on our web page, which you can just um, fill in. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, that's Tim Liner. So Tim uh, has worked with Ion Channels throughout his um, whole career, starting with a PhD in Native Australia, University of Queensland, with uh, Joseph Lynch. After that, he moved to Europe for pretty much the rest of his career. His first postdoc was with Bodo Laube at the Technical University of Darmstadt, and then with uh, Stefan Pless at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and then he um, won a very prestigious European Research Council starter grant, which allowed him to start his, uh, his own group at Michael Sars Institute in Bergen, Norway. So uh, Tim's group uses molecular phylogenetics to dissect biophysical questions, such as ligand recognition in ionotropic glutamate receptors, um, and they're trying to understand um, molecular evolution. Um, among other things. And today we will hear about their uh, recent findings on delta type ionotropic glutamate receptors and also ENEX channels. Uh, and before uh, I hand it over to Tim, uh, just one technical note. Uh, if you want to ask questions during the discussion, please use questions and answer box. Uh, and if you prefer just using your microphone, uh, uh, use the raise hand functionality after the talk, and then you'll be able to um, ask the question uh, directly. Okay, I think that's all the details covered and um, over to you, Tim. Thank you. Once again, thanks, Yelena. Thanks everybody for joining. Yes, today I hope to give you a treatise on uh, Degenac and Iglua function. Forgive the pun in the title, but um, hopefully you see how we use phylogenetic trees um, to understand questions about our favorite ion channels. Um, today I will talk, I'll give you a very brief introduction on how I think about ligand-gated ion channels in three superfamilies, and then explain to you how we generate the trees that we're typically using. Um, then we'll get straight into some results uh, on delta-type ionotropic glutamate receptors, and then some work on ephemerophamide gated sodium channels or Farnax from the Degenac family, and then hopefully leave you with something of an outlook. So as I said, I think of ligand gated ion channels in three major superfamilies. Of course, there are more, but we typically find ourselves um, thinking about these three. There are trimeric degenerin epithelial sodium channels or Degenacs. Uh, these are trimeric channels, obviously. Um, there are tetrameric ionotropic glutamate receptors, and there are pentameric ligand-gated ion channels like GABA receptors and uh, nicotinic receptors. Um, of course, there are more. Sorry if I didn't mention your favourites, but we find ourselves thinking about these three superfamilies. Um, and to generate trees or phylogenetic, phylogenetic trees in our lab, as most of you know, it's relatively straightforward uh, these days to get something simple. Um, firstly, you want to assemble a bunch of gene sequences, and you can just log on to NCBI, enter your gene of interest, and you can also pretty easily search for genes uh, in relevant organisms. And there are so many genomes out there nowadays that you can find animals from just about all taxa. 
And then of course, with all of those sequences, you generate a huge amino acid sequence alignment and you plug that alignment into a program. There's many online to generate your gene tree. Just for this example, uh, this is on ionotropic glutamate receptor gene tree. If we zoom in on one of the branches, we see it's um, an AMPA receptor branch here. And you can start to identify based on the gene names that here are AMPA receptors from deuterostome animals like us. Here are AMPA receptors from protostome animals like snails and flies. And then here are AMPA receptor genes from xenocelomorph worms. And then the closest branch includes human kinate receptors. So then uh, you know that you've got the extent of the AMPA receptor branch here. And then you can start to talk about the evolution of genes because this um, hypothetical gene here would be the last common ancestor of AMPA and kinate receptors. And then what we do in the lab is use these phylogenies to inform our biophysical experiments. Um, along this trajectory, you would be able to trace the amino acid substitutions that gave rise to specific AMPA receptor function. And then along this trajectory, you would be able to identify the amino acid substitutions that gave rise to kinate receptor uh, function. Ideally, uh, it would be nice to reconstruct the ancestral gene. That's not always straightforward, particularly with um, 1000 amino acid long genes like glutamate receptors. Um, so what we can do as a proxy is just try and characterize a broad range of extant receptors to kind of infer what the character, molecular characteristics of one subfamily is. Ah. Conversely, um, we can use the biophysical information that we learn about channel function to inform theories about evolution of these receptors. For example, I just kind of mentioned that AMPA receptors are specific to bilaterian animals. So we can start to say that the function specific to AMPA receptors emerged in the glutamate receptor family in the ancestor of bilaterian animals and has been inherited in uh, extant bilaterians like us. Okay, on to the results. Um, firstly, about delta type inotropic glutamate receptors, where we have tried to study what they are um, and how they work. So, loosely speaking, uh, delta inotropic glutamate receptors are inactive relative to other glutamate receptors. Um, although there's plenty of work emerging to sort of counter that. But anyway, um, here we have a cartoon of an animal inotropic glutamate receptor tree with plant glutamate receptors as an outgroup, you can see that they kind of uh, fall into several different families like NMDA receptors, AMPA receptors, and so on. Now, most of these uh, glut animal glutamate receptors, if you express them heterologously in hex cells or xenopus oocytes, um, and you apply glutamate, for example, indicated by this black bar, you will get these rapid inward currents through the heterologous receptors. It's the same for rat NMDA receptors, for example, although you need to apply glutamate and glycine. And it's even the same for plant glutamate receptors where uh, ligands like glutamate or methionine uh, will activate inward current through plant glutamate receptors. But when you express delta glutamate receptors from rat in xenopersoocytes, um, in this recording, and then apply ligands, we do not see any inward currents through the channels. Um, and that's despite the fact that it's, it's known, there's various studies showing that, for example, crystal structures showing that ligands like glycine and D-serine do indeed bind to the ligand binding domain of uh, delta glutamate receptors and induce conformational change. They just do not gain any current. Another way in which this has been observed is that you can make uh, a, a mutation in the channel domain of rat delta glutamate receptors called the Lurcher mutant or LC there. And then you have spontaneously active channels. Um, this is the baseline here, this dashed line, and then you have this constitutive current. And that constitutive current is actually inhibited by glycine binding or D-serine binding, I guess, because they induce desensitization of some sort in the channel. So wild type delta receptors work, but they're just relatively, I mean, they bind ligand, they're just relatively inactive in terms of currents in most experimental settings. And uh, this mystery has intrigued people for some time. They were first cloned in the 90s. Um, and of course, they were referred to as orphan subunits. And then it emerged that um, delta receptors take part in transsynaptic interactions where they anchor presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes close together uh, by interacting through cerebellum 1 with neurexin from the presynaptic cell. There's evidence that metabotropic glutamate receptors and adrenergic receptors um, indirectly activate 
delta type glutamate receptors intracellularly, I guess. And then finally, uh, more recently, um, there's some evidence that co-expressing the right accessory proteins along with delta type glutamate receptors does indeed yield receptors that are um, have currents in response to glycine and deserine. Um, but here in my lab, we asked ourselves, are there actually active receptors throughout the delta receptor family if we look a bit broad, more broadly? And how did rat delta receptors or human delta receptors become relatively inactive? And this work I'll talk about is mostly done by Giulio Rosano, a PhD student in the lab. And so uh, Giulio generated a phylogeny or two or three. Um, and here I've just expanded in this, in this view um, what I'll call the delta receptor branch, um, which includes each tip on that branch is a delta receptor gene from various animals putatively. And then the closest related genes in the tree are AMPA receptor and kinate receptor genes. So delta receptors are kind of close cousins of AMPA receptors. Of course, AMPA receptors, kinate receptors are glutamate gated channels, delta receptors are not. And as others had shown, when we express rat delta receptors in xenoposoicides, we see no response to typical transmitter ligands. When we looked at another um, chordate, if you like, in white shark, um, glutamate um, and these other ligands, although I haven't shown it, activated no currents. So it seems like inactive delta receptors might be common to various vertebrates. And more evidence suggests throughout the chordates actually. But when we expressed um, delta receptor genes from acorn worms in xenobosoicides, we actually saw GABA-gated currents. And in relatively closely related starfish, um, delta receptor genes, again, we saw large GABA-gated currents. Um, and then in this more distant branch of the delta uh, receptor subfamily, if you like, still uh, from xenocelomorph worms, we saw GABA-gated currents. So this was surprising in a way for two reasons, because not only do we see that there are various active delta receptors throughout the delta receptor branch, but they are gated by the classical inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, not by glutamate, glycine, or deserine. So it seems like uh, a loss of function happened in chordate delta inotropic glutamate receptors. Um, after delta glutamate receptors diverged from their amper and kinate receptor cousins, Presumably very early, they underwent mutations that switched ligand sensitivity from glutamate to GABA. And then uh, when chordates diverged from other, from invertebrates, I guess, other invertebrates, um, they underwent some mutations that made them inactive. And we can hypothesize that this loss of function in chordate delta glutamate receptors um, occurred via 50 chordate specific mutations, because when we align these inactive receptor genes with the active receptor genes, we see 50 positions like this out of a thousand, I guess. We see uh, positions like this, where you have a conserved, for example, alanine in the inactive receptors, serine conserved in the active receptors. And so um, what we sought to do was to make those chordate-like mutations, those 50 chordate-like mutations in the active starfish delta receptor to see if we would lose function reflecting what maybe happened in the in the lineage to rat delta receptors. So wild type starfish delta receptor kind of works like this when expressed in xenoposoicides. Glycine and deserine do not do much. Glutamate activates a small current and GABA activates a very large current. And um, so we plot that here. Sorry, it's a bit small, but deserine is not doing much. Glutamate's small currents, GABA large currents for wild type and uh, 50 mutants. And most mutants um, have a similar prof profile to wild type, suggesting that those mutations have occurred in the chordate lineage, uh, chordate delta receptors, um, and don't really do much to the receptor. But there were uh, five positions where we saw a stark loss of function, basically no currents. For example, this S to A mutation in starfish delta, when we introduced that chordate-like mutation, uh, ligand-gated currents were basically abolished. Additionally, and sorry, you can't see it in this graph, but additionally, there were four sort of moderate loss of function mutations where currents were just a bit smaller. And there was one mutation that stood out. Um, it also had small currents, but it had a change in the ligand selectivity profile. So now glutamate was acting larger currents than GABA. Um, and so we, uh, we next wondered uh, where these loss of function chordate-like mutations are in a model of our starfish, active starfish delta receptor. 
Um, glutamate receptors, as I said, are these tetrameric proteins with um, architecture reflected in this cartoon here. Um, this clamshell-like thing here, or Pac-Man here, is the ligand binding domain. If we zoom in on an alpha fold model of that lig ligand binding domain, we see that the um, four of the five stark loss of function mutations are in the lower lobe of that ligand binding domain. One of them, one of the mutations uh, is down in the um, channel forming sort of domain. The four moderate loss of function mutations um, are also in the ligand binding domain, two of them um, in the lower lobe, two of them in the upper lobe. And then that change in li ligand selectivity mutation uh, is in the hinge region of the ligand binding domain at the back there. So it's interesting that out of 50 uh, mutations that occurred in chordate delta receptors that are spread out throughout the receptor, it's like the, the, the nine or 10 crucial ones seem to be in the lower half of the ligand binding domain. Um, and I, talking to people at conferences, particularly Andrew Plested, who had some nice insight on this, uh, but also from our reading of the literature, it was interesting that it's the lower lobe because it's um, in AMPA receptors, for example, been implicated in function um, by many previous studies. Um, in this model from this review, um, glutamate binds into this clamshell of the ligand binding domain, and at, at which point the channel's closed. The lower lobe moves upwards and wraps around the ligand, which pulls open the channel forming helices. And then, even in the continued presence of glutamate, the ligand binding domains kind of reshuffle or fall apart from each other from two subunits, um, such that the tension there is relieved and the, um, the channel closes again. And that's desensitization in AMPA receptors. And this nice study from um, Andrew Plessis' lab sort of showed that. In AMPA receptors, you can mutate single residues in the lower lobe of the ligand binding domain of AMPA receptors and switch recovery from desensitization kinetics to AM to kinate receptor like levels. So, at least between AMPA receptors and kinate receptors, that lower lobe of the ligand binding domain is crucial for um, desensitization kinetics. So, we wondered um, if these chordate mutations are decreasing starfish delta receptor currents by desensitizing the receptors somehow. So the idea was to add a drug that blocks desensitization onto those non-functional mutants and see if we get function back. And indeed, that was the case. Um, we can argue about whether concanavalin A is a drug that uh, blocks desensitization or does something else, but um, you know those receptors can be active. It's just that that mutation puts them in an inactive state. Um, so L-delta igloas may be relatively inactive because after diverging from invertebrates, L delta receptors accumulated mutations in the lower lobe of the ligand binding domain, which enhanced desensitization. Um, so we asked if we could potentially reactivate L delta receptors by introducing those starfish-like mutations, I guess. And so now here, I guess, is a, a kind of model of uh, rat GLUD2 delta receptor in which we've introduced the converse mutations, if you like, the um, starfish-like mutations at these five stark loss of function positions. And in what I'll call the five times mutant, unfortunately, we did not reactivate um, rat delta receptors with those five crucial mutations. So we tried combining with those five, the sort of four moderate, um, moderate effect mutations, generating this nine times uh, rat delta receptor mutant. But again, uh, we did not see any reactivation. Uh, ligands were not activated in any currents. At this point, we didn't quite give up because you remember that um, there's this lurcher mutation you can make in rat delta receptors where uh, in the absence of ligand, the channels are active and you have a constitutive current and that's inhibited by ligand binding, like deserian binding. So we tried our, you know, our mutants on that lurcher background. And when we had the five stark loss of function mutations, um, or the converse thereof, on the lurcher mutant background, you see this leak current and it's inhibited by glycine and deserine and a pore blocker. So that's not really different to lurcher on its own. So again, those five mutations are not really doing much. Um, in our nine times mutant, where we have the five stark loss of function, the four moderate loss of function mutants um, in the lurcher background, we saw something very different. Uh, this time, the channels were not leaky. Uh, most ligands did nothing, but glycine now was activating these slowly activating currents 
uh, and those currents were inhibited by pentamidine, the, the pore blocker. So it seems like on the lurcher background anyway, reintroducing those starfish-like or ancestral-like mutations into rat does kind of reactivate some activity. And then finally, uh, into that kind of active mutant, we, um, we added this um, G to S mutation in the hinge region, which had altered uh, ligand selectivity. And in this 10 times mutant, now glycine and deserine were activating currents. So hopefully um, this is a nice example of how we can use phylogeny to sort of dissect receptor evolution. Um, and um, at this point, I'll move on to the, to the next section. Um, is that a question in the thingy? Do we want to address that question now? Uh, there is a question, but we can address it after the talk. Here. Okay, certainly, sure. Um, okay, so nextly, I'll be talking about trimeric uh, DEG-ENAC channels, specifically uh, FARNACs or ephemeramide gated sodium channels. And uh, in a project where we asked, what are the molecular determinants of neuropeptide-induced gating? Um, so the DEG-ENAC superfamily, uh, when I started studying it, I guess one of the first things I noticed is that it's functionally a very diverse superfamily. Um, it includes proton-gated channels, such as acid-sensing ion channels that are in our nervous system, bile-acid-sensing um, bile ion channels in our kidneys that have been um, characterized more and more by Grundelab in Germany these days. Um, it also includes neuropeptide-gated channels, uh, both from hydrozoans like hydra and um, also in a separate clade neuropeptide gated channels uh, from snails and they have perhaps perhaps been characterized uh, for longer and we were interested in these neuropeptide gated degenax because while several distinct subfamilies are gated by neuropeptides um, as you can see here when when um, Farnax were first cloned you have this ephemer of amide gated sodium currents through the channel other DEG-ENAX are simply modified by neuropeptides, but not actually activated. For example, our acid-sensing ion channels are activated by low pH, and that current rapidly desensitizes. But in the presence of ephemer of amide, we get that rapidly activating current, and the, the peptide ephemer of amide prevents desensitization of ASICs. Um, so we were curious, what are the molecular determinants of channel gating or activation by neuropeptides? And this work was mostly done by Mowgli Dandamudi, another PhD student in the lab. So Mowgli wanted to compare uh, snail Farnac, with, which is gated by ephemerophamide, with rat acid sensing ion channel, which is not actually activated um, by ephemerophamide. But because only a few snail Farnacs had been characterized, all with similar amino acid sequences, um, we would have to mutate just to, well, more than every second residue in the Farnac channel towards an ASIC-like residue um, and look for a loss of function. So it'd be a lot of mutants. Um, so we wondered if there are other Farnacs out there that could give us a better picture of the amino acid sequence that makes up neuropeptide sensitivity. So Mowgli started by just showing like others had shown that snail Farnac, uh, what its uh, neuropeptide sensitivity is like. You can see that um, it conducts large ephemeramide gated currents or, or currents gated by similar uh, neuropeptides. And it's not gated by various other neuropeptides um, from snails or worms. When he looked at um, channels from other mollusks, like octopus, oyster, limpet, um, similarly, he found farnax that are gated by those same neuropeptides from those animals. But looking a bit more broadly in the degenac tree, uh, Mowgli saw that in annelid worms, there are uh, ephemeramide gated channels, so Farnax, but there are also uh, channels in worms that are gated by ephemeramide and some other neuropeptides. And indeed, uh, some of these seem to have evolved, evolved into channels not gated by ephemeramide much at all, and instead gated by these longer neuropeptides, which I call warmides. Uh, And so, oh, and then uh, looking a bit further out in the tree, of course, eventually we get to genes uh, that do not seem to encode ephemerophamide gated channels. And so now we know that the Farnac branch um, or Farnac family is, is kind of this broad, 
And so now we can align more finite sequences to try and pull out the amino acids that, that encode what I would call the molecular signature of Farnax. Um, and now we can try and establish the molecular determinants of peptide activity by looking for amino acids conserved in all Farnax, but very divergent in non-Farnax. And then of course, uh, mutating the wild type snail Farnac to have the non-Farnac-like amino acids. And of course, some of those uh, positions turn out to not be important like that one. In contrast, um, this arginine, for example, which is conserved in Farnax and divergent in non-Farnax, mutating that residue abolishes fMRFAMI gated currents. And uh, in this anal analysis, I think there were 30 something uh, mutations that had to be made, some of which were combined into double mutants for efficiency if they were right next to each other. And uh, this y-axis here is basically fMRFAMIDE potency. And these are all our different mutants. Wild type and most mutants um, maintained uh, reasonable fMRFAMIDE potency, but you can see in white, there were six or seven uh, mutations that abolished fMRFAMIDE gated currents. And so uh, in a model at the time, in a model of FANAC, uh, we wondered where those amino acids are in the protein. And it turns out that of those seven, uh, six of them cluster closely together in this pocket between adjacent subunits. Only one of them was a bit further down towards the channel. And so uh, particularly with my background in pentameric ligand gated ion channels, um, I thought, oh, well, that must be the ligand binding domain. It's at the interface of adjacent subunits in the extracellular domain. You know, the channel um, twists in response to ligand binding and, and opens. But of course, um, it could be that those residues are important because they mediate allosteric, um, you know, coupling of ligand binding and channel gating, or they might even just be determinants of um, channel assembly. Um, and we'll come back to those questions soon, but what I will just say about that section is that um, what we learned from that analysis is that, is that now we have a better picture of the Farnac family and the neuropeptides that activate these Farnacs. We can now uh, look at, you know, burgeoning sequence data from many of these invertebrate animals, find neuropeptide sequences and channel sequences, and start to say uh, which neurons which release in which peptides are, you know, eliciting excitatory activity in the nervous system. Um, and what we also learned from an evolutionary perspective, I suppose, is that uh, Farnax were, are shared by various spiralian animals, so like mollusks, various worms. Um, but in annelid worms, Farnax evolved into receptors for other neuropeptides. But we were left with the, um, with kind of our original question of how fMRFAMIDE activates the channel. Um, and of course, I won't name the names, but um, you know, someone said to me at a conference a couple of years ago, well, why don't you just do cryoamulant? At the time, I had never done any structural biology, um, so I was a bit uh, nervous about it. But of course, pursuing a high-resolution structure, we turned to structural biologists who know what they're doing. And that was Valeria Kalyankova, a postdoc in the lab of Christina Paulino, uh, who both were at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands at the time. Both have moved on now. Um, and they were keen enough to pursue the Farnax structure with us. Well, they did the work really. Um, so we sent um, three different Farnac genes down to Groningen in the hope that one of them would express well and be amenable to cryo-electron microscopy. Um, Valeria expressed these three different genes and um, I think octopus Farnac, uh, a worm wormide gated channel and a worm Farnac pardon me. And the one that expressed best in hex cells was this Farnac one from the annelid worm Malacosaurus phylogenosis. Um, and just to show you what its function is like, if we express it in oocytes, um, it's quite potently activated by fMRFAMIDE by um, high nanomolar, low micromolar concentrations. Um, fMRFAMIDE is what I'd call a full agonist at this channel. FVRI amides encoded by the same worm. Um, are partial agonists at this channel. And then these longer wormides do not activate the channel at all. Um, so Valeria continued with cryo -EM. Um, She purified from hex cells with detergent, uh, reconstituted into lipid nanodisks and um, imaged grids with or without fMRFAMIDE 
Um, and we're very excited to see that she was able to resolve atoms uh, very well, um, including in the lower part of the channel pore, which is very exciting because that part of the channel is proven very difficult to resolve in various deggy necks, um, both with X-ray and with cryo-EM. So that was really pleasing. And this is what the map of the ligand-free FANAC one looks like, a very good resolution. And if you look down on top, you can see the three subunits in shades of blue there um, forming the expected threefold symmetry uh, around the channel pore, which was to be expected from all the ASIC and ENAC work done by sort of Eric Guo and Isabel Bukongis. Um, and then in the ligand bound, ephemeral amide bound FANAC1, we see a very similar architecture, obviously, but up in the external corner of each of the three subunits, uh, we see the ligand ephemeral amide bound to the receptor. Um, if we look down on that sort of ligand binding pocket a bit more closely, we see that it's formed by alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 helices and a loop uh, from the same subunit kind of wrapping around the ligand. And the adjacent subunit has one helix alpha six is kind of close by. And looking at it from below, just for another perspective where we see uh, the ligand a bit better, F, M, R at the back there, F, amide. Um, you can see that the lower uh, phenylalanine residue of the ligand is closely coordinated by hydrophobic side chains uh, from the channel like uh, phenylalanine 129 here, uh, valine 122, another methionine here, a couple of prolines, a couple more phenylalanines. So it seems like hydrophobic interactions are determining uh, ligand binding. And we probed uh, the role of those residues with mutagenesis and more two electro voltage clamp. Um, and you can see here again, wild types are uh, potently activated by high nanomolar, light, low micromolar concentrations. When this phenylalanine, for example, here, 129, is mutated to alanine, we get a drastic reduction in ephemer of amide potency. Uh, that was the case for several mutations at this phenylalanine position. Mutating this valine residue here also um, altered ligand potency a bit. Um, but surprisingly, several other mutations did not have much of an effect on potency, particularly uh, these glutamates, which we thought might be interacting with the arginine, uh, this glutamine, which is close to the main chain of the ligand, not many mutations up there had much of an effect on potency. So indeed, it seems like hydrophobic interactions are determining um, ligand recognition or affinity. And But to our surprise, these important residues, according to our mutagenesis and according to the structure, are actually very poorly conserved throughout the broader Farnak family. So in Mowgli's earlier analysis, we didn't actually pick up these residues because they're not conserved throughout Farnax. I think the most broadly conserved residue is, is this valine here. You can see it's a valine in various Farnax and Wynax or an isoleucine or threonine. But this phenylalanine, which we found really important uh, through our mutagenesis, it's conserved as a phenylalanine or a valine or a tryptophan in worm Farnax and Wynax, uh, Wynax are the long peptide gated channels, sorry. But it's very divergent in mollusk Farnax. And in fact, while we could kind of align um, this segment of various Farnax, as you can start to see here, it gets very hard to align uh, different Farnax in this region. Um, so the structure is presumably very different from Farnac to Farnac, even here in the ligand binding site, uh, which came as a huge surprise. As you can see here highlighted in yellow, in a similar part of mollusk Farnax, sorry, this is a plasia Farnac, helix Farnac, crustacea, octopus, um, there are conserved aromatic residues that could be, in theory, performing a similar job. And there's mutagenesis data from other labs on mollusk Farnax, indeed suggesting that mutating these phenylalanine residues is detrimental to ephemeravamide potency. So that area there's more divergent than we thought it would be for the ligand binding site. Um, not just in terms of amino acid sequence identity, but um, probably structure. Um, and we'll come back to that weird finding uh, in a moment. But remember that I said that other neuropeptides kind of act as partial agonists at, at various Farnax. So we were curious about that. 
here you can see that FVRI amide is a partial agonist, whereas F MRF amide activates much larger currents. Um, and this is just to show that these FMRF amide and similar neuropeptides come from one precursor gene in these animals, whereas FVRI amides, such as this one I've shown here, are encoded by in numerous co copies in many cases by another precursor from the same animal. And Valeria solved the structure of the FVRI amide bound channel. Um, and what we found, as you can see, is that it binds in the same site as the full agonist FMRF amide. Uh, FVRI amide bound here, uh, shown in orange, you can see that it overlaps closely with FMRF amide in yellow. Um, and that important um, final phenylalanine residue of FMRF amide in yellow is kind of occupied or the same space is occupied by the isoleucine from the end of FVRI amide and the methionine of FMRF amide. Um, the same job is performed by the valine of FVRI amide and the AWS, which we didn't actually resolve from the partial agonist, is kind of hanging out in space, I guess, which fits with the fact that various FVRI amides with variable and terminal segments can act as partial agonists. And so now that we um, had uh, ligand-free and a couple of ligand-bound FINAC1 structures, we wanted to see how they are opening the channel, how the ligands are opening the channel. But when we look at the pore, we see that it's closed and similar uh, di uh, radius in all three structures. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, helices that line the pore. I guess the pore would be on this black line here. You, this is one subunit sort of pointing into the pore. Um, and um, at its narrowest points, the pore radius is about one angstrom, so it's definitely too narrow to be conducting. So we think that perhaps the ligands have introduced, uh, induced a desensitized state, probably reflected in those fast desensitizing currents that you saw. So we wondered if we could force the channel open and try and capture a quasi open state with a pore blocker. And so we tested if dimenazine, um, a drug that blocks the pore of various different DEG-ENAC channels. We tested if it inhibits uh, FINAC1, and indeed it does. You can see that uh, large FMRF amide gated currents here. In the presence of dimenazine, uh, peak currents are reduced, and the sustained current is, is totally blocked. You get a rebound current when you remove dimenazine and FMRF amide, I guess presumably because um, as dimenazine unbinds from that open channel pore, you get current. Um, before the ligands fully washed away. And that block was voltage dependent, uh, weakly voltage dependent, so it's somewhere in the membrane plane, we think. And then looking at the structure, I think uh, you might already notice that the upper part of the pore is already a bit wider open. So it seems like the presence of dimenazine is forcing the channel into a, a slightly more open state. Um, and so now that we had those structures, uh, oh yeah, we could compare pore diameter. And as you can see in orange here, at its narrowest points, the pore is now wider than the other structures, but it's still own the radius, sorry, the radius is only as wide as two angstrom. So if sodium is permeating, it's certainly dehydrated. That's if uh, this is indeed an open channel structure. It's, it's a, pore, a pore blocker bound structure, I suppose. And so now finally um, we could we could look at peptide-induced conformational change in the channel by comparing, in this case, the ligand-free uh, structure with the FMRF amide dimenazine-bound structure. And so ligand-free in shades of blue here, uh, dimenazine and FMRF amide bound in orange. Already you can, well, with my drawings, you can see that uh, ligand binding causes this finger domain, as it's called, to move inwards and wrap around the ligand. Um, and you can see here in the channel domain, um, it's starting to move outwards. So if we look at it a bit more closely, I would say that the finger domain is very dynamic. Uh, if you look down on the ligand binding side and compare the structures, you can see that this helix alpha 2 moves from this resting sort of blue uh, conformation inwards 4 to 5 angstrom to wrap around the ligand. And there's that phenylalanine 129 that we said was very important earlier. Um, in contrast, if we look more to the core of the protein between adjacent subunits in the palm domain, what's called the palm domain, we see that things are very static, illustrated by these residues uh, not really differing from each other uh, at all from the resting state through to the um, 
ephemerophamide and dimenazine bound state. And the residues I'm showing you here are actually some of the stark loss of function mutants of Mowgli's that are conserved in all Farnax and whose mutation uh, abolishes ephemerophamide gated currents. So perhaps they're important, not because they bind ligand, but because um, their confirmation is important for the gating process. And then um, in what's called the wrist domain, you see outward sort of movement uh, of these loops. If we zoom in on that uh, from this particular subunit, you can see that histidine 297 in this beta turn in this loop from the extracellular domain is moving outwards to the orange state. And it looks like it's almost kind of pushing um, the um, upper parts of the channel in orange outwards in the um, ephemerophamide and dimenazine bound state. So in our schematic, this is what it would look like. Um, alpha-2 and alpha-3 helices uh, kind of move inwards to wrap around. Sorry, this is a subunit in one trimer. Then, you know, the pore would be here. This is the ligand bound state, uh, the same subunit. You would have the pore here. Alpha-2 and alpha-3 helices move and wrap around the ligand like that, while the palm domain at the back of this picture for this subunit is totally static. And so that causes that extracellular domain to kind of rotate where this, the core is static, but the periphery is dynamic. And I think that that rotation causes the wrist domain at the bottom to kind of flip outwards a bit uh, via that histidine residue that I showed you before. And that histidine move outwards potentially pushes on the top of the membrane span and helices uh, to open the channel pore. So if extracellular domain rolling gates the channel via this, and we're, we're down towards the last few slides here, I think. Um, if extracellular domain rolling gates the channel via this beta turn histidine residue 297, um, we thought that if you remove that large histidine side chain, like with a serine mutation, then you would lose the thing that's pushing the channel open. Um, so we made H297S mutant channels to test that idea. And what we found was actually the complete opposite. Um, in H297S mutant channels, uh, the channels were constitutively active. So here's your baseline, and then there's this constitutive current, which was blocked by diminazine, of course. And then um, on top of that constitutive current, um, ephemerophamide still activates substantial currents. Um, so much so in the mutant that in solid symbols here, uh, ephemerophamide activates the mutant channels quite potently compared to wild type channels uh, with the dotted line. And at these mutant H297S channels, um, partial agonist FVRIamide potency is substantially increased um, compared to wild type in the dotted line. So removing this histidine, maybe I have text, well, sorry, removing this histidine. Um, actually allows the channels to open more efficaciously, not less. So we think that in wild type Farnac 1, that histidine 2977 actually hinders channel opening. And then ephemer of amide binding releases the break on the channel formed by that H297 side chain. So to wrap up that section, um, surprisingly, neuropeptide binding residues are very poorly conserved throughout Farnax, to our surprise. So perhaps these neuropeptides bind to many different deginac channels, but only activate a few, depending on Farnac conserved residues in the palm domain. Um, and those highly conserved Farnac specific residues in the static palm domain are perhaps required to transduce uh, conformational change down to the channel. And then we think that Farnac 1 channels are primed to open but cannot open until ephemerophamide binding releases the break formed by the H297 side chain. So to wrap up now, I think that phylogenetics offers a useful framework for grasping the molecular and functional signature of a channel family, um, which can be useful uh, from an evolutionary perspective, but also uh, for dissecting substitutions underlying functional changes that many of us are interested in. Um, What's kind of been surprising, I guess, uh, for us in this endeavor is that stark loss of function substitutions often sort of hide or belie significant changes in function elsewhere in the channel. And I think this is borne out by hints from the literature uh, and from complementary techniques, as I think we saw today. 
And uh, I guess conversely, it's moderate loss of function substitutions that, that have proven more noticeably effectual in our glutamate receptor and DEGINAC examples. On that note, um, I'll thank the people who did uh, most of the hard work um, and thank the ERC, the Forstning Audit, and University of Bergen for the funding. Thanks for your attention and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Tim, so much. This was extremely interesting and inspiring. So the first question is from David uh, McCobb, and he's uh, wondering whether it's known if um, knockouts of delta receptors have any phenotype. Yeah, um, functionally, I'm not 100% sure. They certainly affect synapse formation in certain parts of the brain. Um, there's a couple of groups over the years that um, have shown that, I believe. Um, and that's because of that, that interaction they have with the presynapse. So they're important for anchoring the, the, the pre and postsynaptic membranes in development. Um, functionally, um, I'm not sure if that, like, that some people have said that there's a tonic current they mediate, uh, I forget where, maybe dorsal rafe nucleus, um, that's affected by um, GPCR activity as well. And I'm not sure if they've looked at knockout, sorry. Um, so the next question is from Rohit. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, and the question is to what extent temporarily the integrity and robustness of sensitization and desensitization cycle is maintained in inotropic glutamate receptors? Um, like to what degree temporarily is it maintained? Like is it conserved in different types of glutamate receptors or? Um, uh, yeah, that would be my understanding uh, between different uh, inotropic glutamation. The, the sense yeah, okay. Um, sensitization and sensitization. I'll, I'll, between what? Desensitization and? So, yeah, uh, okay. sensitization, activation. Sensitization. Sensitization. Oh, okay. Um, I can speculate. I hope, I don't, I hope I'm not off topic, um, Robert, but um, um, I don't know. Um, I think the fact that the fact that um, concannabinoid A inhibits desensitization in AMPA receptors, which I didn't show, but we have shown, oh, various people have shown, and inhibits desensitization in delta receptors, makes me think that there are some similarities. And what also makes me think that there are similarities is I think it's pretty clear, even if there are some differences, in NMDA receptors, which are much more distantly related, if two ligand binding domains move apart from each other, you'll get desensitization of sorts, and it's the same for AMPA receptors. So if ligand binding domains move apart from each other, you get desensitization. And I hope I'm not too off topic there. Leila, you have something to say? Uh, well, no, we, we, there's quite oh. a lot of questions coming up. So <laughs> actually Sorry. there's yep. a lot of questions from Rohit, so I'll, uh, yep. I'll just add. So the, another is um, related to the second part of the talk. Can F um, FMRFAs have different kinetic species uh, to species? Absolutely. Um, what we see is that um, I think most mollusk Farnax um, conduct mostly non-desensitizing currents in response to fMRFAmide. They're slower activating too, actually. Slower activating and not really desensitizing in mollusk Farnax. But in these worm Farnax, um, the currents are rapidly activating, rapidly desensitizing. So yeah, absolutely, kinetics are different, yeah. Uh, the next question is from Damien Bell. A structure function uh, mutagenesis to the fourth. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Liner. So that's- Tremendous. Thanks a lot. And then from David uh, Eisner, are there naturally occurring polymorphisms in these channels in humans? And if so, do they affect channel properties and function? Um, so um, we don't have the um, Farnax that I was talking about. They're only found in invertebrates as far as we know. Um, in our Degenax, there are certainly mutations that affect um, function, but they're quite different to Farnax. But the delta type glutamate receptors I was talking about, I don't know about humans. I know that that Lurcher mutation I mentioned, um, because you have constitutively active channels, uh, excitatory channels, you end up with neurodegeneration. So there's certainly strong phenotypes for gain of function mutants in rats and mice. I honestly don't know about uh, delta receptor mutants uh, in disease, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, okay, and Rohi just says thank you. Uh, so I guess your answer was uh, satisfying. <laughs> okay, okay cool. hands up, uh, Leila and Connor. Leila uh, first. Hey Tim, that was a really fantastic talk. Super, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, you mentioned in the beginning that the delta receptors, there, was, there had been a paper recently that showed that delta receptors could be activated yep. in the presence of the right auxiliary proteins. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question related to that. First of all, yep. the, do, is it known whether those auxiliary proteins buy near that lower uh, lower lobe? Mm. And do you think they're, they, that you know they're activating is basically destabilizing the inactive state? Yeah. Um. Yeah, interesting point. Um, I think you're spot on. Um, so the 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 um, oh yeah, you're spot on. Um, these presynaptic proteins that kind of bind to a well, presynaptic endosoluble protein that bind to the top. Can you see my hands, or should I unshare my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. The presynaptic and soluble proteins that bind to the top of the delta receptors. Um, seem to keep it tight. And these are the words of the authors, not me, I think. They seem to keep it tight. This is um, the Santi J. Amaron's lab. Um, they also have, I think, some sort of FRET data showing that that those auxiliary proteins mm -hmm. keep it sort of tight. Um, and keeping it tight from above is much like, um, you know, TARPs, like stargazing in AMPA receptors, keeping the ligand binding domains tight from the bottom or from the membrane. So, yeah, absolutely. I think it all comes together. And I think, um, you know, these active invertebrate delta receptors probably somehow keep a tighter ligand binding domain dimer. That's really, um, really interesting. So then, sorry, I just one, okay. one more question. Yeah. So then is that is their functional profile in the presence of the auxiliary subunits similar to that you would see in the starfish um, ortholog? Um, we haven't got that far. Okay. Yeah, we all haven't right, got that far. Thank you so much again. That was yeah. fantastic. Sure. Thanks. Hey, Connor. Yeah, thanks, Tim. That was really fascinating stuff. So I, I think I learned a lot. I, I, I don't know where I missed this. I've got two questions. One I might have missed. So your um, the variance in the binding sites amongst the uh, fat, fat NACs that retain sensitivity to the different neuropeptides. Yeah. Have you seen whether there's any differences in desensitization, um, like recovery from desensitization or something that might be explained by variance in the binding site? I take your point that in the cryo structure, maybe the structures of you're actually showing a desensitized confirmation, right? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So when you've got variations between the different versions of those channels uh, from snail or octopus, do those different versions with the different amino acid sequences, uh, different amino acids in the binding site, do they affect recovery from desensitization or oh, wow. uh, like um, unbinding or something like that? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I'll talk to Mowgli about it because I don't know. It's a simple answer. Uh -huh. But, you know, occasionally Mowgli would say, oh, there's this interesting mutant, but, you know, the the um, the peptide washes out really quickly and the currents look strange. Right, right, right. Um, so I'll leave you with that tidbit and I will make a note of it and we'll have to go and examine that. It's really a good point. Yeah, that's cool. I think a very quick philosophical question. Um, do you... What's your approach for um, balancing comparison of different species, orthologs versus different isoforms within a species? I wonder if you get like increased function, uh, new functions more commonly when you have different isoforms within a species rather than across species. But maybe I'm way off base there. Well, that would fit with our Farnak work. Um, you know, it was just in the similar species where we got that huge diversity. Um, but uh, again, I'll have to write that down and go think about it. Um, with the glutamate receptors, um, maybe the delta receptors is the opposite answer. But I'll have to think about it, Connor. That's interesting. It was certainly the case for Farnax, that, that within species or within taxa, you right, get that right. stark, stark increase in function. Right. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. OK. I don't think there are any hands up uh so we have just one minute for one quick question for me <laughs> okay 
I don't many, but uh, the most pressing one. So the, the phonic structures, there's uh, apostate and the one with the ligand that has a closed channel, right, with the, with the peptide bond. And then you said, I think this is the, the one with the peptide bond is presumably some sort of desensitized state. But when you compare the two, are they... Um, is there are there any structural differences? Because as you when you talked about ampar ultimate receptors, you know they they have this profound structural fingerprint when it comes to desensitization. So mm -hmm. presumably, you know, if it's a desensitized structure, there will be some structural differences between the two or not. Yeah, thanks a lot, Yelena. Um, I brushed over that. Um, the the ex the extracellular domain in the resting state and in the ligand bound states are rem oh hang on. Sorry, the extracellular domain in the resting state and all of the ligand bounding state, uh, states, with or without the pore blocker, are quite different. And yes, the three ligand bound states, with or without the pore blocker, are all very similar. So, so dimidazine binding in the pore doesn't seem to unlock desensitization from the extracellular domain. It just locks the pore open. However, there's one big difference. And that is that in the dimenazine bound state, one of the loops in the extracellular domain flips so that, um, I forget how far, certain residues move, I think 15 to 20 angstrom. Um, so there's this one flip uh, when you compare the ligand bound channel closed and ligand bound channel force open states. Um, and then I guess between the extracellular and so that's the comparison, I guess, of the ligand bound states. Do you, if, if you want a comparison of the ligand free and the ligand bound states, uh, I think it, um, you know, channels closed in all of them, in both. Uh, extracellular domain is very different in both. I guess it's just, it's almost like somewhere between the two, the changes uh, are canceled out as desensitization takes hold okay i okay. mean physically as you go from the top of the channel to the bottom yeah okay, I don't uh, know okay. If that answers it, but... yeah yeah no that's it thank you very much uh that brings us to the end um uh, 1801 in edinburgh at least uh okay i know you've got talks lined up a long long night ahead of you <laughs> So thank you so much for, for this great talk and thanks everybody for coming along and joining us. And we hope to see you for a third seminar uh, in July when Sveta Murthy will talk about uh, mechanization. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks, Yelena. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks so much.